husband was off at the went to the emergency room one day when I was up visiting a friend and helping her with her dad's um, final memorial. And I was coming back, and he says, "I'm in the emergency room." I was like, "What? You know, <laughs> how'd you get there?" Well, he dropped a hospital bed on his toe, so that crushed it, and he was in socks. So that was a whole nother story. Never go into your garage with socks when you have a hospital bed. You have to live by yourself. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> but he brought what what we have is a file of life. So if anybody goes to howtosurvive911.com, they can get a free file of life. And that is all your medical information. It's a fillable PDF. The doctors in the emergency room said, where'd you get this? And he said, well, we kind of put this one together. There are others out there, but this one is, has been specifically designed to make it easy to, to refill out when you have to. And he said, my God, if more people came in with this, we would save more lives. And it, it, forget the app on your phone because you'll forget where it mm -hmm. is or how to find it. And it may take too long to find it. A, a simple piece of paper goes a long way. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me some of the, the parts of the file of life that you created? Sure. The, fi the file of life has who your medical contacts are, who your doctors are, who your emergency contact is, who your POA is. Um, if you have uh, recent vaccinations, you want to know about that, especially COVID vaccinations and when they happen, it's very, that's very um, relevant today. If there are any prosthetics, including dentures, glasses, oh, oh, somebody comes in without glasses and they can't see and you're asked to sign something, well, don't sign it because you don't know what you're signing. If they have hearing aids and they don't have them and you can't figure out why they're not answering, they automatically assume that somebody has dementia because they're not responding. That's not the case. So medications, including vitamins, past operations, it's basically a cliff notes of your medical history that they have. And, and we added blood type in there. And most people say, well, we don't really don't need your blood type. It's like, well, wait a second. If if you, I can save a few minutes, guess what? It could be a life or death scenario. So yeah, I want you to know what my blood type is. That's it. Or relevant blood pressure, things that would be sort of your normal baseline of, of operation. Yeah. Would you say that there's other things you might want people to know about, you know, the family or the caregiver that could be added to the file of life? Well, that would certainly be their contact information, who they are, if if the person who's sitting with them is a caregiver. Now, quite often, because I was 1,200 miles away, I was not down here when there was an emergency situation. And before we had AIDS, a, a dear close family friend told me, Nancy, whatever you do, as soon as you find out if, if Audrey or Stu were in the hospital for any reason, you call me and let me know. And I called her sometimes at four o'clock in the morning. She'd get up and she'd go over there to make sure they were okay and give me sort of a, a, an eyewitness report. So that's important. And some hospitals will just accept that. You, you, you may not, I don't say, I'm not saying lie, but if you've got a friend, you just say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm her sister or <laughs> do whatever mm -hmm. you can to make sure you've got that a approval. Um, for my lead aide, who would always be there in a case for mom or dad, I, she was not a POA, but I wrote out a letter that said in my absence, M Mildred has the right, and I spell her name to, to make decisions and call me. And she is my surrogate. And I had it notarized and she always had it with her. Now that was my way of at least telling somebody that I didn't have contact with what was going on. And it always worked for us and they never questioned it. Do you include um, like advanced directive type of information? If there's in a there? DNR, I would say there's a, you know, just say that there's a DNR, you have advanced directives in there who has the right to, to make those decisions. Um, it's, it's interesting that I found that there are a few questions about that here in, in Florida with my folks. I think probably because they're used to an older population. So there was less pushback, but in other parts of the country that may, that may not be the case. So making sure that you know, if, if somebody starts CPR, like a, a paramedic starts CPR and you don't have a DNR, they're not going to stop. And it's, it's a very, not to be a pun, but a crushing experience for a frail senior who may be in their, their mid to late nineties or, or even earlier and bones break and blood happens and it's, it's physically taxing on the body. So that's important to understand 
my dad did not have a DNR and I didn't know it till I went through all those files. We never talked about it. My mom always talked about it. She says, eh, if, you, if I get to that point, shoot me. And I actually had that conversation with the, our, our doctor when she had a massive brain aneurysm. He said, what should I do? I said, well, mom always said, shoot her. And this was a foreign doctor. <laughs> and he said, we can't do that. And I said, no, no, no. You have to understand it's kind of a, a play on words. <laughs> But we were not taking we were not taking measures, and they wanted to they wanted to medevac her out to do brain surgery on a ninety one year old woman who had dementia, and like I was not going to do that. But I knew her I knew her wishes, and I think those those conversations are critical to have, as scary as they are to have. But don't have them at the end of life. Have them over the course of your lifetime together, and and make a game out of it. Like what, what would you want? Well, you know, I want to be. I don't want to be dust in the wind on the Blue Ridge Mountains. Yeah, that's that's my goal. <laughs> yeah, I've also found that helpful too, is to kind of exchange wishes with each other. So it's mm -hmm. not just all about the other person because Absolutely. we all need to know this information for each other at every stage of life. It's actually more fraught at um in the younger times of life with a yeah. lot of these decisions. Yeah, my, my so parents always talked to me about it. And, and I don't know my sister so much, but we had these conversations. If anything happened to them, who would be our surrogate parents? And I knew their names and I knew where they lived. And they had a dude ranch out in Arizona. I was like, can we do a practice run, God? I mean, this would be kind of fun. Like, I, liked, I like dude ranches and horses. That sounds cool, right? Can I just go visit them? Well, no, that never happened, but... <laughs> So. Yeah. So I'm also interested in the differences between um, Connecticut and Florida. What are what were some of the things that you identified with like the care process between the two different states? Oh, you know, good question. From from an elder care perspective, it I, I'll sort of back up and say, you know, I looked at care facilities at, at some point at looking at moving mom and dad up to Connecticut and from from a variety of reasons, both the financial and legal and having to change all their wills and everything else. And, um, and just looking at the, the care up in Connecticut, it was a lot more expensive, but it was also the, the issues of how do you change their wills? How do you change everything else that was going on? What, what their advanced directives, anything, it, it really was soup to nuts. It was like starting, it was like starting a small business all over again, which is, I, as some might say, it was the business of mom and dad Inc. And that's kind of how I, I managed it, it mentally and, and emotionally. It's like, how do I manage this, this entity of, of my parents so that they could, they could live well. But, um, it is, it is a fancy business in Connecticut. It's expensive. Well, it's expensive anywhere. I don't care where you are, but minimum prices were starting some places at twenty thousand dollars a month just to get in the door. So that's a lot for for a lot of people. Yes, you have difference, but it's not. I, I didn't see talked as much about up in Connecticut. Where down here, maybe it's because I'm dealing with a different kind of community of people who are talking about the business of aging care a little differently, and what does it mean to to the state and to others in the area. Um, but beyond that, there's not a whole lot of difference. <laughs> 